Good evening and welcome. I uh, request uh, our director, Professor Ravindran, to say a few words about this uh, distinguished lecture series of which today is the inaugural lecture. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, um, so, welcome to all of you. IMSC was founded in 1962, we all know that, uh, with an objective of achieving an excellence in uh, research, in particular theoretical sciences. And uh, we know we are all theoretical scientists. And I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the sixtieth year now. And uh, this year we are celebrating the 60th years with uh, all of you. Um, uh, for youngsters and also for our visitor, this institute was uh, born as a result of a theoretical physics seminar series initiated by Professor um, Aladi Ramakrishnan. He was our founding director um, who actually had this great idea of um, you know, calling a lot of eminent scientists to his home and uh, organized talks and discussions and then through which, you know, that it attracted a lot of students. And then finally, it actually, you know, ended up as, you know, the institute that you see now. And we, you know, grew up to this level with a uh, lot of achievements. And this is a very special year because this is 60th year. And um, this year, actually, you know, to celebrate this, you know, important uh, achievements, you know, we have a year-long uh, program with, uh, you know, series of uh, colloquia, uh, workshops, seminars, uh, you know, that some of them would in include, you know, eminent lectures, series lectures and things like that. So today, actually, we'll have a speaker from France, Professor Olivier Pinanov. And uh, this particular one, actually, we have called, you know, um, eminent uh, you know, lecture, uh, lecture series, you know, by eminent scientists, uh, you know, who have contributed to theoretical sciences. And we'll have more talks of this kind and also our different kinds of talks. And uh, before I actually, you know, um, give over, I would be happy actually that, um, you know, if you also contribute to whatever, you know, programs that um, you would like to organize during next one year actually, you know, some of the senior members here, you know, come up with ideas so that this year we will have large number of workshops and lecture series. Okay, so thanks for uh, you know agreeing to give this presentation. This is going to be the first one actually, and we'll have more talks. And I request um, Professor Raghavan to introduce the speaker. Thank you. So uh, uh, we have uh, Professor Keshavan, our former colleague, to introduce the speaker. So. Perhaps I'll just make one announcement before handing the mic over to Keshavan. That is, this lecture is being streamed on, live streamed on YouTube. And for those who have questions, are watching on YouTube and have questions, you can type it into the chat box and they will be conveyed to the speaker at the end of the talk. Okay, over to Keshavan. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's indeed a great pleasure to be at IMSC again. And that pleasure is doubled when I am being asked to introduce today's speaker, Professor Olivier Perronon, who is a close friend and colleague now for almost 50 years. Perronon has been the ambassador for the School for Applications of Mathematics and Numerical Analysis set up by Jacques-Louis Lyons. You see the JLL, which is there in the which put applied mathematics on a rigorous mathematical footing. The very healthy Indo-French collaboration which now exists in this area owes a lot to the efforts of uh, Pirono. He has also been responsible for establishing a very robust collaboration between Academia, Reed, Lyons' school, 
and the industry, in this particular case, the aeronautics industry in France. He stands tall like a colossus, astride two areas, rigorous mathematical analysis on one side and extensive numerical computations on the other. He has pioneered the implementation of the finite element method to fluid flow problems, especially those relevant to the aeronautical industry. He has made important contributions, be it theory or numerics, to several areas connected to PDEs, such as Navier-Stokes equations, conservation laws, optimal shape design, homogenization, mathematical finance, and control theory, to name a few. He has authored or co-authored several books on these topics. He is a member of the Académie des Sciences Paris and oversees its external relations. He is also a Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur, one of the highest civilian awards in France. We are indeed very fortunate to have him in our midst today. And without further delay, I invite him to talk to us about what is latest in control theory and artificial intelligence. Professor Piron. Thank you, Kisavan, for this elogious presentation. Um, I have to climb up to this. <laughs> right, so I have the difficult task to talk to you on a domain for which not very many of you know much, if I'm told. Um, I will fail. I have to tell you, I will fail. But maybe you get some glimpse. So let's see. <coughs> so I will begin with a very simple problem. Uh, it's not a simple problem, but it's a simple problem to understand. You want to go from Chennai to Pondicherry by car. And uh, you want to go as fast as you want. That's the first case. Of course, the engine has a maximum acceleration, and it has a maximum brake. With this, the knowledge of these two things, what is the optimal solution to go from A to B? By optimum, I mean fastest. So in terms of mathematics, I can uh, say that if it's a straight line from A to B, the position of the car, X, will be the solution of Newton's law because the engine gives the force to the car and the brake also a force, a negative force to the car. So, uh, you remember your school time, your school days, Newton's law is x dot equal u. And uh, I have bounds on u because of the acceleration, maximum acceleration and maximum brake. So that's uh, minus gamma little m and, minus, and gamma big M. And I want to go from A to B, so I start at time zero with x zero equal a, and I start with velocity zero, so x dot equals zero, and I want to reach b at time t, so x of t equal b, and I want to be able to get out of the car, so I have x dot of t equal zero. Right, so now you want to minimize t. You want to go as fast as possible. What is the solution? Um, if you don't have any constraints at all, then of course, if you have maximum acceleration is infinity, maximum break is infinity, t equals zero, you can go in as sm small a time as you want. The solution in terms of mathematics is not bounded, it's not in an infinity of zero t. Uh, if you have acceleration, uh, maximum acceleration and brake, case two, what is the solution? It's very 
sort of intuitive. You accelerate to the maximum at, until you reach a certain time and then you break to the maximum. That's how you drive a metro. And you just have one thing to, uh, to determine is the, the switch time from which you accelerate and brake. And that you can do by hand. Now this type of solution is called a bang-bang solution in the uh, terminology of control. It's not continuous. So you see that you have a mathematical problem again, that the velocity is uh, not continuous. And now suppose that, uh, suppose that I have a speed limit. I cannot drive more than 100 kilometers, otherwise I get fined. And uh, suppose also that I don't want to spend too much fuel. So I have to balance the time, T, and the consumption of fuel, which is written here as uh, an integral of f of u over zero t. Now the problem becomes impossible to solve by hand. Okay? I don't think you can find a solution to that problem analytically. I may be wrong, but, but I don't think so. So, you see already that we need the tools we need some mathematical tools to be able to do that. And you have a, a last complexity, is that uh, you're not too sure about uh, the effect of the acceleration or the brake, and so you have some random error on the effects. So the, the, the equation x dot equal u could be uh, random. There might be some noise which you don't know. So this problem, even though it's very simple, is actually in the full complexity of control theory. Um, now, if you want to send a, a rocket from to Earth to the moon, you have exactly the same problem. And this, when I was a student, was a $1 million problem, which the NASA was ready to pay for the solution, and there was no tool at the time. So here, here are the main uh, guys who contributed to the, to the field. Uh, <coughs> the, so, you know, control theory in those days was also called system theory. They had all kind of vocabulary. And uh, uh, the equation x dot equal u, in this case, I, I change it here. It's a vector system. Uh, it's called a state equation. And uh, u uh, is a control, um, <coughs> so brake and accelerator. And the people who contribute the most is uh, uh, Bellman, uh, Richard Bellman, but uh, uh, he invented what's called dynamic programming, which is a completely crazy name. I will explain to you a little bit what it is. But in fact, retrospectively, uh, we discovered in the 60s that the biggest contributor to this field is actually a French man called Adamar, who is, uh, was working in 1990, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 20th century, 1910, something like that. Right, and now um, the, um, I put the name also of Kalman uh, because of his Kalman filter, and I put the name of Pontryagin, who is a, a Russian mathematician, who, by the way, is blind, so this is really an exceptional contribution, uh, because he contributed to uh, the problem of bank-bank uh, uh, control. And Kalman filter, I think it's here for, for th historical reason, but I, to, to me, it does not really belong to control theory. But anyway, it is listed. And if you list uh, Kalman filter, then you may as well list also uh, the extension, which is called uh, robust control or H-infinity control, and maybe the biggest contributor is uh, Israeli uh, scientist called Tannenbaum. And now, now we have the neural networks. 
So the big question of this lecture is, um, is neural network shaking the whole thing and uh, uh, do we forget the past, do we forget all the mathematics? And you will see that the answer is not easy. So this is a plan of the lecture. Uh, let me get rid of Kalman filter. It's only one slide. I show you that uh, it's not exactly what I want to do. And then uh, I will show you, uh, remark, recall to you some basis for the optimization, uh, how to solve an optimization problem, because you have to see that this field is driven by computer, computer solution. If you don't have a computer, forget it. It's not interesting. You come to cases which you can't solve most of the time. So computer uh, solution of optimization problem. And then I will talk to you about uh, <coughs> calculus of variation. Sorry, there is a mistake. Then dynamic programming. We'll see uh, at each time, uh, if possible, what AI can do. And then I will end up with the hardest of the, all these problems, which is called stochastic optimal control. So I hope you can follow me. And I tell you, you have to be <laughs> concentrated. So the first slide, I'm not going to use, but just for the theory, let me recall you uh, what is uh, Kalman filter. The problem is that you have a system. The system is x dot equal f of x, but there is noise. So you're not sure that your system is f x dot equal f of x, you have to get rid of the noise. You can, uh, you can assume that the noise is, is, a, is a Brownian motion, uh, so a normal uh, uh, <coughs> a Wiener process with, uh, no, it's not normal, it has a, a covariance matrix Q. And then <coughs> you, you cannot observe all the variables of the system, you can only observe some part, some variable, z, so, uh, so x is sort of an internal variable to the system, and what you see is, S, is z, z. And z is a nonlinear function of x, and it has also some noise. And the question that was put by, uh, to Kalman is, um, <coughs> how do you make sure uh, that you can actually handle this problem how to get rid of the noise, and how to get the best knowledge of this problem. So what this means is that because you cannot uh, observe x, can you determine uh, an approximation of x, which is the best, in the sense that it minimizes the uh, uh, random error between the true value and your estimate, knowing the past. Uh, and this is the solution that proposed, uh, uh, proposed by Kalman. Uh, it is, he says that your, you can estimate, your best estimation is a solution of x dot equal f of x, f you know, okay? So f, the function f and h you know. So you will solve x dot equal f of x, but not with a w, because you don't know w, but with something which is called a feedback. So whatever you observe, z, you, you try to estimate v by being z minus h of x, and you multiply by a matrix k, which is called the gain, the v feedback gain, and this is the best you can do to know your system. So in a way, uh, it is close to optimal control, to control because you want to minimize an error, but you have here no uh, control as the pedal of my car, uh, uh, brake and acceleration. Here you have a system, the system, you don't know it very well because of all the noise, and, you, and Kalman proposed to you a method to get rid of the noise, okay? So this was a big revolution in the days that I was a student, in the 60s, 70s, um, 60s, uh, because uh, it, and it's now used everywhere in the industries. Everywhere you have a system like this, you uh, immediately put a filter 
in order to get rid of the, of the unknowns or the noise. And the problem here, I, I search in the literature, can you do better with uh, AI? So the closest network that would be, uh, um, if you know AI, would be a recurrent network. And can you do better? And I'm afraid I have not found anything in the literature, so I'm not so sure. I think this is already pretty good. So first negative answer. Now, I will skip that. So this is the extension uh, robust control in order to, to do a little better than Kalman. Uh, uh, instead of minimizing the error in the sense of uh, probability, you can, measure, you can minimize in the sense of uh, maximum norm or L2 norm. And what you do is you do the same, the same system theory thing, but you put the, uh, you don't say that the optimal solution is a feedback, you put it directly in the system. Okay, so I'm not going to speak about filtering anymore, and now I concentrate on control. So control is a subclass of optimization. What is optimization? Optimization is finding the minimum of a function, uh, except that here we have a multidimensional variable u. But it's still finite dimensional. Okay. Uh, you remember your classes. What's the minimum of a function? The place where the gradient is zero, the derivative is zero. Uh, you remember that from school days. Okay. So in, 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 in multiple dimensions, it's the same thing, except that uh, it's the derivative with respect to all the variables with respect to which, to which you minimize. That must be zero. And the question is, <coughs> is it sufficient to find the minimum? The answer is yes, if the function is convex. Otherwise, there may be several solutions. So, <coughs> so now the problem is that f is too complicated. You cannot solve this. Even if you wanted to solve it, you would need some kind of Newton method to find this nonlinear equation which is more complex than finding the minimum itself. So what do you do? So let me explain to you what is the steepest descent method or gradient method. Uh, but before that, uh, <clears throat> of course, what you could do is, so suppose you are in such a landscape and you want to go at the lowest point in the valley. What do you do? You could throw all kind of measurement points randomly, and if you throw enough of them, you will find one of them which is lower than the other, and you decide that this is the minimum. Essentially, this is uh, the, <coughs> um, the gist of genetic algorithms, which are random exploration of the, the, the landscape here, and one of the best ones, I will use it later, is called CMIES. Um, uh, done by a German guy called Ansel. Uh, but most, <coughs> most of the time you want to do better than that. This is terribly expensive to try to, uh, you try all the points uh, and you have to compute f at all the points and you take the, the, the least one. This is in general is too expensive. So you have a better method which is called a gradient method or steepest descent method. And it's written like this. So let me explain. Um, so you, you blind the lady, and in order to make sure that she doesn't fall, you have a man next to her. And what the lady does, she goes like this, and she measures how much she goes down. She goes like this, she measures how much she goes down, etc., at all uh, directions. And she decides to go and walk in the direction which has the most descent, okay? So, <coughs> so in this case, she would probably go this way. Now, if you take the level map of uh, the landscape, so you go this way, but then at some point, you're blinded, remember. At some point, when you walk, you feel that you're going up. So then you stop. Then you stop and you start again, left, right, etc. And in terms of uh, graphics, what it does is that you here, you find the, the steepest descent direction, 
and when it starts growing up, you stop, and you do the same thing, and you see here in this particular case, because it's almost uh, quadratic, you will go very fast to the minimum, all right? So this is a steepest descent method. Uh, it's written in terms of, uh, of the gradient of the function, so the vector of derivative, because we are in finite dimension, and uh, uh, this rho is how much you walk in the direction of descent. So you have to walk until you go up, and that is written like this. And uh, uh, by doing so, eventually you will reach the minimum. There are, there are a variation of this method. Uh, a conjugate gradient method is a variation, quasi-Newton, etc. It's, it's a big field. Optimization uh, is a big field in itself. Uh, but it's already old, and uh, I don't think it's, diff it's hard to be creative in this field. It's more or less fixed, except that <coughs> you, ha you may have some constraints. So in this type of picture, the lady will walk into a bush. Okay, so she has to stay on one side of the bush. This is a constraint. Uh, uh, so when you have constraints like that, it becomes substantially more difficult. So you have to read a book on optimization if you want to know more details. So now I have a crash course on AI, neural network. What's a neural network? A neural network has inputs and outputs. And in between, it has layers. Uh, and each circle is called a neuron. So this is a, <coughs> a vocabulary, very fancy vocabulary given by people in computer science, especially in vision. Uh, but if you translate it in mathematical term, it takes a completely different picture. It is this one. So when you go from one layer to the next, you take x, all the variables, x is a vector, and you multiply by a matrix, you add a vector constant, and then you make a nonlinear operation to the result, uh, which in the fancy uh, vocabulary is called an activation. And the most popular one is the sigmoid or the uh, RALU function, which actually in math we call the max or the x plus x plus. Uh, okay, so. Uh, um, so you, you do that at every layer. So you start with the input, you do this operation, you get all this uh, array of values here, you go again, you get another one here, so you, you make a composition function of this, of this, and eventually you get an output. And the objective of learning is to minimize the output with respect to some expected value. So you expect xd, and you get xp, and unfortunately xp is not close to xd because a and b are not properly chosen, and so you will adapt a and b by a minimization algorithm in order to get this small. So this is called learning, and this function is called the loss function. Then, so the rest, there's a lot of uh, very, very well done implementation to solve this problem in computer science. Uh, mostly, uh, you have to learn uh, uh, <coughs> the language uh, Python. And uh, uh, you have something called Keras or TensorFlow, which will do that for you. You don't have to do anything, you just have to specify the input data, the output data, and the structure of your network. So how many of these coefficients you have. Now, uh, so first of all, in principle, I don't have to use this function. I could use my function that I want to minimize. My experience, however, is that if you don't use uh, one of these uh, functions which is produced, by, uh, which is part of the software uh, TensorFlow, the results are a bit more difficult, but it can be done anyway. 
And there's a funny, so this line is a funny line that tells you that indeed this kind of solution is actually possible. It's called the universal representation theorem and it's a proof which is pretty stupid. It says that any function can be approximated by uh, something like that. And the, the proof is very, very easy. You write the function as the integral of the derivative. Then you replace this interval by the heavy side function, which is 0 or 1, depending if you're less than x or big, bigger than x. And then you approximate the heavy side function by a, a sigmoid. So the heavy side function is like this, and the sigmoid is the same but smooth. And so phi is a sigmoid, and there is a coefficient in the sigmoid to make it sharp or not sharp, epsilon. And now you look at this formula. Well, this formula is a formula of this type. You have approximated the function f by a linear combination of the input, a x, so x over epsilon here, plus a vector b, this vector here, and you multiply by a coefficient, so that is missing here, but uh, okay, for it, it, there are networks in which you have an extra coefficient outside, and so you have a representation of a function f by a network. So what it means is that when you have solved this problem, any value of f of x can be uh, computed by, <coughs> so if I have a new x, so I know all these coefficients now, I have a new value for x, I put it here, da da da, I get an output, the output is the value of my function. And that thing can be put on a telephone. Okay, what is hard is this part, once it is done, once you know the coefficient, it can be ported to a smartphone, for example, or a tablet, and this is the success of a, a neural network. So, <clears throat> now I'm going to the second problem. It's a problem in finance. Uh, so, uh, probably you've never seen these kind of equations, unfortunately. This is a stochastic differential equation. It's the same thing as a differential equation, so it's like x dot equal rx plus x square root of v uh, w dot. But the problem is that w is a Brownian motion, and you're not allowed to write the derivative of Brownian motion because the Brownian motion is not differentiable. And so you have a, a new theory for this kind of equation which, by the way, in terms of computer, is very easy. Because to realize a random uh, Brownian motion, you take a Gaussian variable, and uh, you, uh, uh, <coughs> you have a random number generator on your computer, and you just take a value, uh, and uh, you multiply by dt, square root of dt, and that will, that will give you this thing. So you have two of these equations. This is called the Aston model, and <coughs> the Aston model is used to compute uh, financial derivatives like put options, uh, which uh, uh, mathematically is written like this. Uh, so I have no time to explain exactly what it is, but uh, <coughs> uh, X could be the value of Tata Motor Company and uh, P would be the value of uh, uh, <coughs> an option on the Tata company, a Tata Motor company. Okay, if you don't know what it is, uh, uh, never mind. <coughs> but anyway, this is a formula. I take K minus X at time T solution of that, system of two equations, multiplied by the <coughs> uh, uh, down, um, uh, sorry, uh, discounted with the interest rate of the market, and I take uh, only uh, if it's positive, because P has to be positive. Uh, if it's negative, then I've lost the money. That's what it means. So, uh, this problem in finance is, uh, is quite, uh, it's not artificial, it is used uh, uh, 
Uh, by the way, the, the two bounded motion are correlated, and rho is the correlation. So uh, the question is, by observing the market, what does it mean? You take today's newspaper, and you see how much is uh, the Tata company value. Uh, so that will give you x0. And uh, how much is the volatility of this uh, uh, asset? That will give you v0. And then that will give you the price of this put option. And the question is, you want to know it in the future. Uh, <coughs> so you have to you take uh, the history for the last 15 days with many values for x0, v0, and p0. And you try to reproduce it with your model. So you, you will run this equation with some values for the parameter. You don't know, you don't know the parameter. Kappa, theta, and lambda, they are parameters, they are numbers, and rho, you don't know them. So you, you just invent one of them. You get a value here. This is the initial condition here. You get some values, and you try to reproduce what you read in the paper, P0, D. That's an optimization problem. So the optimization problem, even though it looks multi -dim uh, infinitely dimensional because of that, it's actually in dimension three because uh, I'm looking for three parameters. So uh, you can do it with uh, the standard uh, <coughs> software for optimization like CMIS, and it, it's, the result is very good. This is an, um, a case where we start with uh, the exact solution. So what I do is I find an exact solution which I try to reproduce. So kappa equals 3, theta equals 0 0.1, lambda is 0 0.2. As I start for kappa equals 6, uh, et cetera, and then I run my optimization, and after 1,000 iterations of sigma s, I find exactly the exact solution. So the problem with this solution is it's very expensive. 1,000 iteration. I have to iterate my uh, stochastic differential equation 1,000 times. Too expensive. So, and by the way, uh, this is the plot of P versus X and V for two values of the, for different values of the coefficient kappa, theta, lambda. So let me go back. I'm losing my audience. Uh, so for, for certain values of kappa, theta, lambda, you get certain solutions. The, certain, the solutions you get is this. It's, it's actually a function p of two variables. So. For these values, you get this picture with x here and v there, and p is the color, and for this one, and you see it's a bit different. So I'm going to use this difference in order to see if neural network can find the answer. And uh, when I did that, it was uh, three years ago. It was the beginning of, uh, well, yeah, three years ago. I wasn't too good in uh, manipulating TensorFlow. So I, did, I said, well, okay, uh, I'm going to use one of the most well-known program for um, uh, uh, character recognition, which is available on the internet. And it works like this. <coughs> you have many numbers like this, which are unwritten. So, of course, the 9A and the 9A are not written by the same guy or girl. Uh, and you want to make sure that uh, you can recognize that this is a 9 and this is a 7. So, MNEST does just that. And uh, uh, <coughs> uh, so, what it does is that it takes it as an image. It's uh, discretized by 24 by 24 pixels, very coarse. And then it tells you uh, it's a classification uh, program which uh, classify all the results into 10 uh, variables. And of course, these 10, uh, these 10 classes are the values 1, et cetera, to 9. 
uh, I forgot the O here. So I'm going to do the same thing, but instead of using these images, I use my images. Okay, 24 by 24, very coarse. And it works, it works. It works, but it works only sometimes. So it works for the parameter kappa. It's terrible for the parameter lambda, and it's okay for the parameter theta. Which means that uh, um, <coughs> identifying the parameter of this um, software for simulating options by doing it by um, <coughs> neural network is a bit risky, let's say. Uh, and also the, the answer is stochastic. Sometimes it's good, like uh, maybe this one is good, and sometimes it's terrible, like uh, this one's good. Uh, where is one which is terrible? I don't know. This is not good. This, this has 25% error or something. So the error is stochastic. You don't know if, um, if, if it is uh, near to the solution or not. So I think that um, on the other hand, you have something that you can put on a telephone. And, and for bankers, it's very important because they are in the, in the, in the stock market and very fast. They have to compute these things. And no other methods can do that for you. <coughs> right. So <coughs> now let me go to infinite dimensional optimization. So it's getting more and more complex and uh, it's late in the day. So we have to uh, see if we can if we can do it, okay? So I want to minimize a function in infinite dimension. So J is given to me, but U is unknown. I want to find the U, which is an infinite dimension, uh, which is a function itself, which gives me the least value for this integral. And the way to do it is calculus of variation. This is invented more or less by Adamar. What you do is just uh, very, very natural. You take uh, a variation of u, u plus lambda delta u, where delta u is a function of x also, and you approximate the integrals by uh, some uh, Taylor expansion or whatever you lo would like to call it. Again, mathematics that you've learned in your young age, your uh, education. <coughs> so if you keep first order terms, you will get, uh, you, you come to this conclusion that uh, the limit of j of lambda delta u minus j of u over, over delta u is this minus that over lambda. It is this integral. And now, Adamar says that this limit is, uh, is, is called uh, uh, the gâteau derivative of j in the direction delta u. If you can write this derivative, directional derivative, if you can write it as an L2 scalar product of delta U times something, then you are in business, you have defined a generalized gradient in infinite dimension. So according to this definition, the generalized gradient is J prime, uh, grad U is J prime. And so whatever I said about optimization uh, choosing uh, the direction in which you, you decrease the function at each iteration will work with this idea. This idea can be generalized even to shape. You can, uh, you can uh, say that if I make variation of the shape in the, in the normal direction, I can show that the derivative of this integral with respect to normal variation to, uh, yes, to lamb, uh, so you see omega is changed to this dotted line here. I get to this formula, and because this is a scalar product in some space, J will play the role of a gradient. And some problems, uh, <coughs> topological optimization, are still unsolved in this line. 
Right. So um, now, I, now I am able to give you the solution of the car, which was going from Chennai to Pondicherry, in all the generality. And you see that it's not easy. So how do how do I do that? Um, so I have to minimize the, the, the time it takes to go from A to B, uh, weighted by the, the consumption of fuel, subject to Newton's equation, and subject to the fact that I want to arrive in B with zero velocity. Uh, so in this particular case, I cheat. Uh, I use these three equations to find x as a double integral of u, with these constraints. And then I do calculus of variation on these guys. So I get that delta j is delta t plus alpha delta t because of the t here times f plus alpha f prime delta u. And now uh, I have these two constraints here which are written uh, uh, which, uh, which I differentiate. Uh, so I have to write that uh, this double integral uh, is written here. This double integral gives me position B. So this is x of t equal B. And x dot equals 0. This is it. And so I can differentiate this and get this red equation and this black equation here. I can eliminate delta t. And then I get an answer. I get that delta j. So you don't want to follow all this. But in the end, you have written that the variation of j is an integral times the variation of u, and the, the gradient, therefore, is this fellow here. So it's not easy, you see. And uh, the, pr the problem is these constraints, um, the constraints here, which are, uh, are these two equations in red, and uh, I use one of them to eliminate delta t, so one remains. And so I have to say that the gradient is sub something is added to the gradient in order to have the constraints to be verified. Now, if you go to the computer and use uh, gradient method, minimization method with this information, you will get the solution to your problem. All right. So this is the way Adamar solved uh, some problem of mechanics in his days. Now the question is, can we do that with DNN? Uh, of course, you can try. Uh, Karniadakis has a late paper where he says that, uh, so th the, the thing which is not obvious for the specialized in AI is that you want to mix AI with equations of physics. And uh, that, uh, so there is a paper by Karnadakis where he calls physically informed DNN, and you probably can do it like that. No time to go in details. I didn't try. Okay, I skip this. Well, what's the time? Oh dear. Oh dear. So, <coughs> uh, dynamic programming, I will probably have no time to go very deep in it. Dynamic programming uh, is not so easy to understand. It's uh, this is, uh, uh, Richard Bellman who gave uh, this idea. If you have to minimize a function of this type, so it has something at the end, and it's linear with respect to an integral in time, then you can introduce a value function. And uh, so what you say is that uh, let's look at this problem, but instead of zero here, I put a tau. So you see, minimum from tau to t, and now I put instead x of tau equal y. So I get a function, which is a function of y of y and t, tau. Now this function, you can, uh, you can see easily that uh, it will have to satisfy this equation. Uh, so when you have time after dinner, you can check uh, that uh, uh, indeed uh, this has to be true. And so the solution of Bellman is to say, I will solve the system of my physics here with the system of values here. 
and uh, this is a, uh, this will give me the solution. This will give me u. It's very hard to do because this is forward in time from 0 to t, and this is backward in time from t to 0. So the solution of Bellman is very hard, uh, but uh, uh, it's not used for deterministic system, but for uh, uh, stochastic system, it's the best solution. So this is the last problem that I want to do with you. Uh, stochastic control problem. What is it? So again, I take uh, a practical problem, which I didn't invent. It's my colleague Pierre Auger, who works with uh, fishermen in Côte d'Ivoire, no, Senegal. Um, <coughs> so you have a, but it applies to India. You have a village of fishermen. If you don't do anything, the fishermen will fish all fish in their neighborhood. So you give them fishing quota. If you give them too strong a fishing quota, they go to see the government and uh, you're thrown out. If you, if you give them too weak, there will be no fish. If you give them a reasonable quota, so you have to talk to them, and it works. They understand the idea of quota. Uh, because it's their job, they eat from it. Uh, and, um, uh, but they don't like that you say one day you can fish 50 kilo and the next day you can fish 100 kilo. That they don't like. You have to say, well, today 50, tomorrow 51, something like that. So in terms of mathematics, what does it mean? You have an equation to represent the... Um, behave, the, the equation uh, for the, the logistic equation, it's called, for the fish density in the sea. It's a nonlinear equation. Uh, I sent you to the paper why it is like that. And it has a, a randomness, it has a no, random noise, because of course you can't be exactly sure how much fish there is in the sea. And you start from an initial condition, which again you don't know, but uh, with certain randomness. And you want to minimize, uh, you want to be as close as possible to uh, ideal state. So the ideal state is uh, some fish population that was year, uh, there five years ago, for example. So you want to be as close to that. But in order to do that, you will have the quota on the quantity of fish that you can uh, uh, fish, so that is the U which is there. If you put a U which is too small, uh, so you cannot fish too much, then, um, uh, so it goes in the opposite direction. If, if U is, is too large, uh, then the minimum uh, is, um, so this corresponds to the case where the quota is severe. And then also you don't want to have too much variation. So on a stochastic uh, uh, problem, the variation is called uh, uh, quadratic variation. It's, 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 it's high probability theory. I mean, it's uh, uh, master plus one course on probability theory to uh, get this guy properly defined. So now you have an optimization problem that you want to solve. Um, so so this is a solution. So the idea of Bellman works very well for stochastic problem. So again, uh, probably no time to go through the, uh, the, 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 the problem, but basically you, you discretize the equation for the which give you the fish population in the sea, and you use Monte Carlo in order to realize the noise. You make many samples of this equation and you average. And so in the end, you can compute the criteria which you want to minimize as an average of many solutions, uh, stochastic solution of your equation. And you use uh, uh, Bellman's principle to uh, solve this problem, no detail given here, and you get this solution. What is this solution? Here, you see, uh, the, the blue solution is without quota. So if you start with a weak population of fish and you have no quota, 
the fisherman will continue to fish and it will never go up. If you put some quota, eventually it will go up. And now, unfortunately, with this method, the quota, which are in the dotted line here, are bang bang type, uh, and they are not good. So basically, you, this tells the fisherman that if there is no fish, you must uh, catch as few fish as possible. If there's big fish, you can catch many fish. <laughs> you don't need mathematics to get to that solution, right? <laughs> okay, but but it's it's a not it's a non-admissible solution for the villagers because one day they eat and the next day they don't. Uh, and it, it, again, same thing. Uh, if you if you if you have many fish in the water, so no quota and then it decreases. So with quotas, you stabilize it. Without quota, it continues to decrease. So in terms of solution, you can look at it as uh, uh, the function, the control. The control has to be uh, Markovian. So it, it, the control must be only a function of the actual um, population of fish, which, by the way, is a vector. Huh? You have many, many fish. Uh, uh, many type of fish in there, uh, um, and the time. So here I have the time here, I have the fish population there, and my control is the surface. So if there are few fish, uh, bah, the, um, <coughs> the quota is very low, and if I have a lot of fish, the quota is very high. So. <coughs> Very disappointing to spend uh, many days and computer solution to get such a disappointing curve. Now, let's try another method. So again, no time to go to the details, but uh, there are other methods to solve the same problem, and then the solution is different. So you see it's slightly sloped here, and that very small slope here makes a huge difference in the solution. Uh, again, with quota, the quota is in dot here. Uh, you, you go to the red, so the red is going slowly to the ideal state one, if you start from below, while uh, without quota, you stay low fish population. If you have high fish population, in the beginning you have no quota, and slowly, quota is reestablished. So, um, there are two different solutions, very different. Which is the best? Well, in order to see the best, you, you minimize, you look at the value of the minimum. And the value of the minimum with the first uh, stochastic uh, uh, Bellman solution is here. Uh, with whether you start with a low fish population or high fish population, so it's a curve like this. And you see the difference. This one's lower. Uh, but this one does not respect the quotas, the, the problem. So the grief that I have with this method is that the control is bang bang, is unacceptable. Meaning by this that the, this term is not properly uh, taken into account by this method. While in this one, it's perhaps taken too much in the method. And also uh, some singularity is there. So both methods have their problem. What about, uh, what about neural network? So neural network, uh, level of mathematics much lower. You, you take the, um, uh, this is your criteria. You want to be as close as possible with many solutions of your stochastic differential equation. And you have the representation of the control. So your surface here is represented by a neural, uh, neural network. So it has parameters theta. And you do the learning uh, by minimizing this function. So you try to find which are the value of theta, which minimize my cost function. And uh, that works. And the solution is mm, acceptable, let's say. You see the slope here is not straight, so it will not be a uh, bang-bang control, and it's smooth. So this is, in a way, the best method. And indeed, uh, you have a solution with and without quota here. 
without quota, the solution stay low. With quota, it go, goes up, and uh, opposite here. So this is one case where DNN does better than the classical method, okay? So I come to the, I had another example, but I'm afraid time is, is going. I will just finish by one slide <coughs> for the most difficult problem uh, currently under investigation by people who are, uh, let's say, uh, num not numerical analysts, analysts. Uh, it's a Monge Ampère Kantorovich problem. Uh, so Monge is a fantastic guy. He's a mathematician during the French Revolution, and he was in charge of uh, the Navy and uh, bringing uh, ammunition to the army who beat the British. Uh, and at the same time, he did some mathematics. I mean, uh, we dream of people like that nowadays. Uh, he was pro also professor at Ecole Polytechnique. Okay, so what Monge, the, the problem with Monge is that he had uh, some uh, sand, so he had some sand, so he had a distribution of sand uh, uh, depth or height as a function of x, and he wanted to fill the sand in the, some, uh, uh, he had a hole, and he wanted to fill the hole with the sand. And he wants to do that in a minimum effort. Uh, in this case, it was will bounds. In terms of mathematics, the problem is uh, written here. You want, to meet, you want to find a map T from the red to the, to the blue. The red and blue are uh, either the height or the density. And uh, you want to minimize x minus T of x uh, for the density alpha, for the height alpha, uh, subject to the constraints which are here. And that problem uh, is very difficult. Uh, Kantorovich in Russia has the same problem. He wanted to bring uh, armaments or goods uh, from uh, one industry to another and so on. So a similar problem. Kantorovich is also an impressive guy. Uh, and uh, my colleague Brunier uh, found uh, uh, this uh, theorem, which says that uh, this problem is equivalent to a nonlinear partial differential equation, uh, which is very difficult to analyze. Okay, so um, this type of control is called uh, 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 mean field game control, mean field game type control. And I had an example in finance here, but I think I have no time to go to uh, explain it. So my conclusion is that um, <coughs> when I was a student, control was a buzzword. Today, AI is a buzzword. Uh, how does it fit together? Has AI killed control? The answer is no. Has AI made uh, control progress? The answer is not yet, but I think that it will. Uh, people try all sorts of uh, uh, neural networks to solve problems which are categorized in, in terms of uh, control, uh, as a control problem. So thank you very much for the invitation. I, I'm sorry uh, if I have lost you or uh, in any case, thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much. So, any questions? Question on the web about. Attends, tu, 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 tu enlèves ton masque, s'il te plaît, et tu me dis. Et... Oui. Quand tu fais ton, ton, neuro, euh, ton réseau neuronal, oui. euh, tu as une fonction non linéaire et matrice. Oui. Euh, Est-ce que la fonction change à chaque étape ou est-ce que c'est toujours là Alors, euh, bon. So I say it in English. Yeah, you have I this non linear. I'll, I'll say it for you. Um, so in this very uh, uh, very short introduction to neural network, the active function phi 
the question is, do you change it at every step? The answer is no, but that's because the software is written like that. If you want to change, it's fine. No problem. You, you add too many parameters, after, you don't know exactly what you do, but. So the, uh, from the slide of this uh, Mongampier problem, so it very much uh, sounds similar to the optimal transport problem. Yes, it is the optimal transport problem. Okay, so, so my next question was, can optimal transport uh, provide us better solution than the optimal control now have? Um, uh, you can AI? No. No, no. The, the, the optimal transport is better in some sense compared uh, to the optimal um, control. Okay. Astrovastic uh, optimal control. Yeah. <coughs> of course, you can, you can do a numerical solution to that. Only if you are in the convex case. Um, and so uh, if, if you can show that phi is a convex function, then uh, the solution poses no problem. But if it's not convex, it's a very difficult problem. It's this hyperbolic part and so on. Uh, there is a... One man uh, I know who is working on the numerical solution, but uh, basically they use all the tools that I, I've given you. I mean, calculus of variation, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. The 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 problem um, the problem is that the, your solution is is not regular. Uh, it's too bad I don't have the picture, but I could show you. Suppose there is a file here and you want to get everybody to go out in uh, the fastest time. What is the best way? Knowing that the doors are here. This is an optimal, uh, uh, um, this is a problem of that type. And the solution is very discontinuous, but basically it tells you that each rank, uh, each uh, row goes to uh, one side and then they go on each. <laughs> it's, uh, but, they, but it will compute. You know, it's a management of crowd. It will tell you exactly how much time it takes to empty this auditorium. Uh, and the problem is, if you want to have a reliable solution, you better be uh, numerically very careful because the solution is highly discontinuous. Stampede in. In Kumbela, uh, manifestation, so you have uh, uh, yeah, yeah. millions of people, uh, the same issue? The software has been sold to the maker. Uh, they go around here. Uh, and uh, in order to uh, stop the number of people when, uh, who goes around, when uh, in, case, in case there is a panic, uh, that no, not everybody dies because it happened once that they walk on, among, uh, on, uh, on top of each other. So melee would be similar. So these are from the YouTube. I, I'm not sure if I understand them, but I'll read them out. Uh, this is from Pankaj Kumar Mishra. So there are two questions. The first one is, in a real-time scenario, can we have constraints on the state variable such that the upper and lower bounds of the state variable are a function of another state variable and control variable? The answer is yes. Uh, the more, the, uh, if you add more constraints, you make it more difficult. But uh, all the tools that I tried to uh, describe briefly will allow you to find a solution with these constraints. Uh, you have, uh, basically, the constraints, one very easy way is to uh, penalize the constraints. You just, uh, uh, OK, 
okay, you have to look at Google penalization of constraints. You'll find out how to do it. Uh, otherwise, you, you have to use uh, uh, <coughs> um, Lagrangian methods, uh, uh, optimization method for constraints. Uh, it's tough, okay? You can get stuck by the constraints. Now, the constraints in the case of uh, neural network, that depends very much on the constraints. It's not always uh, possible. Uh, uh, inequality constraint like bound, maximum and minimum bound on the variables or uh, on the coefficient, no, not the coefficient, the, the variables is easy. But any nonlinear constraints, I'm not sure I can answer. Thank you. There's a s second question. Uh, I don't know if you've already answered it. Uh, it, uh, it sounds similar. It is, a well, known, it is well known that uh, neural networks can approximate an unknown smooth function on a compact set. Can we use neural network to approximate a function that explicitly depends on time? Sure. Um, sure, sure. Um, I mean, um what they call recurrent, no, recurrent network is, um, is a process in which uh, the, the learning improves with, uh, with a variable, which is time. Uh, 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 so, um, you know, when, when you, um, uh, I, I'm not specialist, so I may, I may say stupid thing, but it is used for translation or recognition of speech because whatever you say at time t is uh, enlightened by what you've said before. Okay, so, so this, is a, um, this is a case where the answer is a function of time. And uh, the way I solved my problem by neural network using um, <coughs> a control with, is a function of time. So, so the, the picture that I showed you, they are function of time. Uh, you see one variable here, the, this one is time. Thank you. So we'll thank Professor Pirano once more. Thank you.